Hello everyone, my name is Carlos Torres and I welcome you to this week's edition of the Backline Report. Every week, my co-host Fred Alvader and I get together and check in on the world of golf to bring you the latest news, insights, analysis, interviews, recaps, previews. We cover anything and everything golf. In other words, if it happened in golf, we have it for you. Fred, hi, how are you this week? Carlos, I'm pretty, I'm pretty happy. Thank God baseball is back. It looks a little weird with no fans in the stands. I was able to watch my Indians over the weekend. It was great. I enjoyed it. There is a little trouble in paradise, however, and you know, what have we been talking about all year? COVID-19 raised its ugly head. 11 play well now 17 players actually on the Miami Marlins were tested positive and Monday's the Marlins game are uh, canceled there down in Miami. Their, their home game's down there right now. The Yankees were supposed to be playing them. Um, the, uh, I'm sorry, the Orioles were supposed to be down there. The Yankees were supposed to be playing in Philadelphia where the Marlins left, but they're, they're not holding any games in Philadelphia because the Marlins were there and they might have contaminated everything. Um, now the Yankees are going to go play the Orioles or something. I don't know. I mean, it's just, it's a real mess because it's COVID stuff. So, but that's baseball, and Carlos, that just brings out all the problems, and it kind of shows you what a great job that golf is doing to keep guys, you know, kind of healthy. I mean, they've had a few positive tests, but for the most part, it's working out the way it's supposed to, and guys are staying away, they're, they're using their masks, they're staying distant, they're taking care of themselves. Evidently, down there in Miami, a bunch of baseball players went out Went out of the town, evidently, got around too many people, and they drug up through the whole team. So now we got an issue. I don't think it bodes very well for football. Uh, college football is still a little bit up in the air. The NFL thinks they're going to start practice. Uh, we'll see. But uh, meanwhile, we got a lot of golf to talk about because they just keep chugging along. All the tours are back in action this week. We get, we get to talk about the Champions Tour. We get to talk about the LPGA. Um, we got a we got a WGC to talk about this week. Michael Thompson got his first win in seven years last week up in Minneapolis. Tiger says he's not going to play in WGC. He's, eh, he's too good for that. The LPGA Tour returns to action in Toledo, Carlos. Um, we got a golf. We got a lot of golf, so I'm excited. Let's go. You got to be happy. It's going to be right there in your backyard in Inverness. I mean, it's going to be interesting because that's going to be also the Solheim Cup next year. But uh, like you mentioned, I mean, we got to give kudos to golf. Golf is doing excellent. Uh, and for those who were trying to really bring it down at their efforts of containing COVID-19, now go look at baseball and everything that is happening in some of the, of the other sports, you know. There you see how good they really are doing. And we kind of expect when you have team competition, it's very difficult, especially baseball. You have to be traveling so much as well. Uh, team sports is really difficult for you to contain them let's see how the nba does but anyway our sport here is golf and we have a lot to talk about this week and uh let's start we always recap the back of this weekend's action and, and uh weekend backspin and we're gonna start talking about michael thompson you mentioned it. i mean he played a a very clutch back nine to win his second pga tour title he did it by two strokes at the 3m open it had been a long seven years since his last PGA Tour victory at the Honda Classic, which was his only one then. But he closed it out in his style. Let me tell you, he got those two birdies in his last three holes. He definitely went for it. And he finished at 19 under par to beat Adam Long by two and nine players by three. And it was a tight final day there at TBC Twin Cities. Uh, Thompson was holding off several players and uh, at two under for the round, the winning shot came at 16. That's, that's if you go for, in baseball, there's a, the game-winning RBI. That was the game-winning the game winning shot for him. He was facing a 40-yard bunker shot. I mean, it, you know, a bunker shot is the most challenging shot in golf. It was that drivable par four, and he executed it to perfection to live in for tapping, tapping birdie. That really gave him the, the win there. A par on the 17 kept him one clear. And then he played a closing par five conservatively. He, he knew he had the, 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 everybody else had to come to him. So he played it conservatively. He hold from 15 feet uh, for winning, uh, for winning birdie. Uh, 
it's sad, you know, because he celebrated and all that, but there was no 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 cheers, right? Because there's no fans. But hey, he was extremely emotional after the punt went in with his family at home, including his three-year-old son and uh, the newly adopted daughter. Uh, but he was key. His putter was on fire. I mean, he was 61 out of 64 inside 10 feet. That is a whooping 95%. I mean, he was just, he he ranked first in shots uh, game putting. He made 10 putts outside of 10 feet. Okay, 35.4 was the longest one. He was just some, uh, a putting machine. So now Michael qualified for this week's uh, WGC and next week's PGA Championship at uh, the for the U.S. and the U.S. Open at Wingfoot. And he said, hey, Wingfoot is my favorite golf course in the world. So I really want to see how he's going to do that. And he's going to play there because he's very excited about it. But Fred, finally, for now, he also has job security for until 2023, and he's moving up to 99th in the world. Yeah, you know, we had the story earlier in the year of when he set out the coronavirus in Tulsa, right? While they were adopting uh, their new child. And um, so kudos for him. It was a great story that we had. And now he comes up a winner. And, you know, he was in control through the first three rounds. He, he led every round. And, you know, a control is a pretty good word to describe his game. Uh, this was a course with a ton of water and players had to avoid a drowning plus navigate the greens, which as you pointed out, he did a great job navigating greens with that putter. He led from start to finish, didn't show any signs of too much pressure. Uh, very good up and down from that bunker on 16, uh, outstanding bunker shot actually. Uh, managed to make par and the par and then the birdie to finish out. Uh, take his uh, two second career win uh, since the 2013 Honda Classic. Speaking of the Honda Classic, the PGA uh, National down there, that's another golf course with a lot of water and a course that you've got to control your ball around the golf course. So, um, you know, he's he, he was runner up in a U.S. Open. Um, you know, he um, he has a control game. And so a place, um, you know, like uh, for like the PGA playing in Harding Park, if he's in a good place right now, that may be a good tournament for him. That might be a good golf course. And he might do well in uh, at Wingfoot if he likes the golf course and he's on his game that way and he can make a few putts, he could be a contender. He's got that kind of a game, Carlos. Um, after firing consecutive 80s to miss the cut at the Memorial, Dustin Johnson carded the final round 78 in Minneapolis and withdrew, I'm sorry, first round of 78, withdrew citing a back issue. He already has a win since the restart, looked to be one of the favorites heading into the PGA Championship, but if the back's a little iffy, he's, I, we're going to talk about it a little bit more later, but he's going to try and tee it up in the WGC this week. We're going to have to see how he gets along with that, Carlos. Definitely, and uh, we're going to talk about the WGC soon, but that is definitely the, <clears throat> you're mentioning about water, and uh, TPC Southwind is where the most water is in any golf course, and most uh, golf balls get into the water, so watch out, maybe Michael Thompson will be one of the favorites then, if he's able to manage that course, but anyway, uh, definitely congratulations to him, great win, but again, uh, all the big names, where were they? They were nowhere to be found. And uh, maybe it's, <clears throat> I, I was listening to a friend of mine telling me, I'm concerned, man, what's going on with golf and the, the biggest names. Uh, I told him, look, it's it's tough because there, it was three months that they were out of doing nothing, basically. You know, you lose that cadence of practice and, and, and also being playing almost every week, week in, week out. So it's difficult for you to get back into into form, but uh, there's that also allows you to have injuries, which is what we're seeing from some of the players. And uh, I, I ask you what he asked me, are you concerned about the top players? Because the leaderboard here didn't look like like nobody was playing. It looked like nobody was playing there, a big, big, big names. You know, you, you bring up a really good point, um, and we probably should discuss this a little bit, when you're playing tournament golf, it's way different than playing golf with your buddies, okay? 
every shot matters, but you have to play every shot. Uh, you have to have the confidence that you're going to pull it off. Plus, you can't put pressure on yourself. So with this shortened season like this, I mean, we've only got a couple weeks left until the FedEx Cup playoffs. Look at Kepka. He's still outside number uh, outside the top 100. Um, he's not even in the playoffs at this point. Uh, you know he's putting pressure on himself for a couple high finishes, so he gets himself in there. And, and these guys know it's a sprint now. It's not like a normal year where, okay, it's one tournament. No, I missed a cut. No big deal. We'll just go on the next week. Kind of like the baseball season this year where there's only 60 games. It's more of a sprint this year. Every game gains importance. It's more like the NFL where every game is really important. Right now, every, every tournament is important on the PGA Tour. And I think you, you're seeing these guys put a little more pressure on themselves. These young guys or some of the no-names, they're just firing. They're out there, tickled to be death to be playing. They're just firing at pins, making pots, doing their thing, where some of the older guys are more veteran guys that are used to kind of more of the leisurely pace and working their way into it. They don't have that, they don't have that luxury right now. They need to get after it and get going, especially Brooks Kepka. If his knees bothering him, then he needs to not play. Pete Cowan said this week that, uh, that he's okay. He just needs to get, get over it. So uh, we'll see. But you make a really good point, Carlos. Uh, to play really top-notch tournament golf, uh, it has to be just another round, just another shot. And right now, it's not because it's more like a sprint. Every shot is important, and they're putting pressure on themselves. Like you mentioned, this is out of the normal for them. So they are all, they are all adapting. They're trying to do the best that they can. They know the pressure is on. But I, I think that at the end of the day, and this is going to be a very good <clears throat> teaser when we see, and we're going to talk about it, the WGC is going to be like a, a good preview to see what we're going to be seeing at the PGA Championship next week. But anyway, now there was another tournament, and it was on the other side of the pond on the European Tour title, and the European Tour where Renato Paratore, the 23-year-old Italian, he dominated the, that British Masters at Close House to win his second European Tour title. Renato took a one-shot stroke lead into the final round. He never looked back. I mean, he carded two under 69. There were very, very harsh conditions there. And he won by three. I mean, he, it looks like he was the only one playing good that final round. He finished at 18 under par. Then Mark's Rasmus Hoshgard was second at a 15 under. Justin Harding was one back in third. Andy Sullivan, great to see him back. Uh, very close atop top of the leaderboards and Robert Rock. They joined Dale Whitnell in a tie for four. Uh, other notables uh, players there, Oliver Fisher finished solo seventh. Pablo Larrazalo finished T21. Golf's most interesting man, Miguel Angel Jimenez, finished T38. Eddie Pepperell, who definitely we're, we'll have to talk about his diet. I mean, I, I don't know if he's ah. doing something there. But T47 and the host, that was the surprising one. Lee Westwood, he finished last in 70th place. I mean, uh, maybe he, he had some other things in mind. But Fred, as for uh, Paratore, Renato is now moving up to 152nd in the world. And it's interesting to mention the last time he won in Sweden, uh, it was also under harsh conditions. So uh, it seems like he thrives on this type of, of weather and conditions uh, to play. And uh, hey, he did the best of it and he won it there. Who is Renato Peratore? Well, he's a 23-year-old guy from Rome, Italy. This is his second European Tour win. He won the 2017 Nordium Masters. He was a standout amateur, reached the quarterfinals of the 2013 Amateur Championship at Royal St. Ports. Uh, back in 2013 and 14, he won the Junior Orange Bowl in Miami, uh, the Portuguese Amateur Championship, the Trofeo International, uh, the Italian amateur stroke play. So he won a lot of stuff as an amateur. He was uh, men's individual gold at the Youth Olympics. Uh, also played a junior Ryder Cup a couple times. Um, he was, uh, he's also lost in a playoff. He lost the 2000, last year, he lost the 2019 uh, Mauritius Open in a playoff. So this guy is up and down though. Uh, his only appearance at a major was the 2019 US Open last year, didn't make the cut. He has been kind of an average pro on the European Tour since 2015, 
best finish in the race to Dubai was 57th in 2016. The last three years, he finished at 73rd, 81st, 88th, making a nice living, but not making a lot of noise internationally. Maybe that's about to change, Carlos. Maybe this gives him a little more confidence. Maybe he's got his game where he wants it. Maybe we're going to see him over here in America soon. Like I said, he's been hit or miss, but maybe this uh, change of scenery on the European tour where all of those top players are not there is giving those other second-tier players, to call it that way, some exposure to championship golf and try to get to compete every week atop the leaderboard. So that's what we have seen so far. And Renato definitely took the best of it under what harsh conditions, which again, they are the Nordia Masters, the, his other wing. It was the same way. It was harsh conditions and he was able to pull it out. Now, let's talk about the 2020 Price Cutter Shed Charity Championship. It was won by Max McGreevy who picked up a big win there at the Corn Ferry Tour event at Highland Springs Country Club in Springfield, Missouri. McGreevy won the 72-hole tournament by a shot over Jose Jesus Rodriguez, uh, posting a 21 under 267 on the back of the final round of an 8 under 64 that shot him all the way up through the leaderboard. Chad Ramey finished alone in third in the normally scheduled event, two shots behind McGreevy. McGreevy won the 117,000 winner's share of the 650,000 purse and earned 14 official World Golf ranking points with the win. Fred, he also earned 500 Corn Ferry Tour points that will get him a little bit much closer to earning a spot on the PGA Tour for the 2021-2022 season through the Corn Ferry Tour. Yeah, we talk about, we talk about a guy who's been up and down. This guy has been up and down. Um, great 64 on Sunday. Uh, started five shots back and just moved right up through the field. So uh, kudos to him for that. Um, a little, little background on him. He's, he's 25 years old. He's from Oklahoma, and he, and he is a graduate of the University of Oklahoma. Over the last two years, he's played in 28 events on the Corn Ferry Tour. This was his first win. He has had three top tens and earned 180,000. Uh, the win moves him clear up to eighth on the Corn Ferry Tour finals list, but uh, he's only made four cuts in 12 starts this year. He is, uh, you know, he doesn't make many cuts, but when he does, I guess, you know, he does all right. But really funny, uh, last year, another Oklahoma teammate persuaded him to go over and play in China on the PGA Tour China, that developmental tour. He made the cut in all 13 tournaments, had nine top tens with one victory, and only finished outside the top 20 on two occasions. His consistency earned him a return to the Corn Ferry Tour this year. Plus, he was the Order of Merit winner on that PGA Tour uh, China, Player of the Year, and he earned almost a million bucks, $974,000 over in China. So, you know what, even if he doesn't make it this year, uh, oh, the PGA Tour, he can still go back and play in China. He makes more money over there. So, um, yeah, it's amazing to me. He was so consistent in China. Here back in America, he's just been up and down. It's been a roller coaster. Only four cuts in 12 starts, guys. I don't know. If I were him, I would, with that money, I would just get some uh, Cantonese uh, lessons and just move there. I mean. It's yeah. doing so good. I was just, I was Learn just Chinese and get a place in Hong Kong. Yeah, I mean, yeah, go for it. Anyway, the 2020 Firefighters Casino Hotel Championship final leaderboard was headed by winner Hussein Liu, who won in the Symmetra Tours restart at Battle Creek Country Club in Battle Creek, Michigan. Liu won the 54 hole event by two shots over Bailey Tardy, finishing on 13 under. Janie Jackson, who won the Lone Symmetra Tour event before the season was suspended, finishing solo third place. Kim Kaufman and Gabriel Chipley finished tied for fourth place at nine under total. Uh, Fred Liu won the $26,250 winner's chair of the $175,000 purse. So on the just the second tournament all year, they, they had played only one before the pandemic uh, shutdown happened. So only in the second one, we got our winner. And then to the restart, at least we're getting 
everybody playing back, so the Sinatra Tour is back. Congratulations to Rishan Lee for win Liu to winning the, the Firefighters Casino Hotel Championship. Fire Keepers. Fire Keepers. Fire Keepers. Fire Keepers, <laughs> Fire Keepers is, is a casino right there in Battle Creek, and they sponsor this. Uh, uh, Liu is a native of China, so we're talking about China. Here's another uh, uh, young Chinese player doing well. Uh, she finished 67th in the 2016 LDJ Final Qualifying Tournament to earn her Sumatra Tour status. Uh, she's won three times on Sumatra Tour, um, and uh, she, uh, she moved up to the, to the LPJ Tour, uh, just couldn't quite make it, is back on the Sumatra Tour again. Uh, she's the uh, uh, sixth player in Sumatra Tour history to surpass $100,000 in a single season. Uh, en route to making it to the LPGA. Um, we got uh, Alex Pano made another cut as an amateur, Carlos. Holly Clyborne, our good friend, made the cut. Um, also, I want to mention a shout out to uh, uh, Gabriella Shipley. You mentioned her. Uh, she was, uh, she finished fourth. She's an amateur as well. Uh, she's playing golf at Grand, has played golf at Grand Valley State but has an extra year of college golf left because it got washed out this spring because of coronavirus. So she's gonna go and play for Kentucky uh, starting this fall. So uh, she's from near, nearby Battle Creek. She, she lives in the neighborhood there. So uh, uh, good for here, Carlos, back to you. And with that, we wrap up our recaps of this weekend action. Now let's talk about our four goal or our preview for this weekend's action. There's two big, big things going on. There's the big tournaments, the WGC on the PGA Tour, and that's the one that we're going to be talking to you about right now. It is what I mean, we can say in what is probably the biggest two-week stretch so far in 2020, because the PGA Tour will go to Memphis for the WGC FedEx St. Jude Invitational before the PGA Championship take the spotlight next week at Harding Park. So we're going to have two big tournaments going back to back. I mean, this week's no cut event will be a good, if hot, uh, tune up for a lot of the best players in the world as they will try to back the last of the GC of the year. And the only major of the season in a 14 day stretch. Now it's time for some high level golf from the best players in the world and they're due. Our first WGC uh, event since the shutdown will feature 45 of the top 50 players in the world, including the newly minted number one golfer, John Ram. And of the players who qualified for this event, Tiger Woods, Adam Scott, Francesco Molinari, Justin Rose, Papa Shugo, Imahara, and Lee Westwood will not be in the field. Scott and Molinari have yet to play a tournament since golf has returned but are expected to be in the field next week for the 2020 PGA Championship. And we'll talk about Tiger Woods pretty soon. Now, after hosting the British Masters this past week, it appears like Lee Westwood will not only skip this week, but the year's first major as well. And we have some news about that as well. Now, Henrik Stenson, ranked number 34, five in the world, Sean Norris, Lucas A. Bird, Robert McIntyre, Sebastian Soderbergh, are making their first starts since the PGA Tour uh, resumed their play. Michael Thompson received the last spot in the field after winning this past weekend at the 3M Open, 3M Open and he bumped Sham Kim out of the field. So Fred, big time field uh, this week. Let's talk about it. Uh, what you think about this tournament uh, and the field? Yeah, is I mean, you mentioned it. A lot of top golfers, you've got uh, the top eight are all there. Um, as you mentioned, Rom, Rory, uh, JT, Dustin Johnson, Webb Simpson, Brooks Kepka, Bryson DeChambeau, Patrick Reed uh, are all set to compete there. Um, did, you, did you know Patrick Reed's still number one on the European Tour R in Merit? I think he's only played in two of their events and those, you know, their joint sanctioned events that he's done, but uh, he's still leading the European Tour Order Merit. I couldn't believe that when I saw that today. Um, this was, you know, Carlos, as you, I'm sure you know, this was supposed to be the men's Olympic week for golf in, uh, in Japan. And so instead we got the WGC St. Jude that's still in that slot. Um, just because Tiger's not here, uh, we've got some really good names. You know, I mentioned all the top guys. In addition, you've got Matthew Wolf, you got the, uh, 
um, Morikawa, you got Matt Fitzpatrick, Bryson, uh, Justin Thomas. They've all been playing at a very high level this year. Um, wouldn't count them out. And one more guy you want to add in there, Victor Hovland. Um, I, you know, I kind of like Victor Hovland. I kind of like Matt Fitzpatrick this week. I, Fitzpatrick got a lot of confidence coming out of the Memorial. Uh, uh, you know, having bones on the bag and, you know, he had that great Sunday round. Um, this could be a course that he could do well on. So uh, I kind of like him this week. Uh, Daniel Berger. Daniel Berger's won here twice at Memphis. And uh, he's back on his game. He has a win earlier this year. The guy we got to watch, though, I mentioned it earlier. Well, two guys, actually. We got to watch Brooks Kepka to see if he can have a good finish to get some FedEx Cup to move himself up on the points list so he can make the playoffs. And the other guy, what about Dustin Johnson's back? Um, you know, that 80-80 and missed cut at the Memorial. Then he had to withdraw last week. Uh, is he even healthy enough to, to, uh, to compete? So, um, and you know, we mentioned Lee Westwood not doing well at the British Masters as the host. Um, I found this interesting, you know, uh, he's not too excited about coming over here and playing. Matter of fact, he's just not too excited about playing at all. Of course, if you're playing that bad and you're finishing last, uh, you know, you don't feel like playing, that's for sure. Here's a quote from Lee Westwood. It's just not the life I'm used to. I got out on the golf course and I'm struggling for motivation a little bit. There's a lot more to consider. The two American tournaments next week and the following week, I'm still concerned that America doesn't take it, the virus, as seriously as the rest of the world. It still seems to be one of the hot spots for outbreaks. I can control me not getting the virus and take all the measures I can, but somebody might pass it on. I don't really want to get ill with it. I'm slightly asthmatic. If I tested in Memphis, I would have to stay there for two weeks. Right now, there's just too many ifs. So Lee's not coming over. He's going to stay over there, which he's not a good place to play right now anyhow. So it doesn't really matter. And while we're talking about the players, Carlos, I just want to do this real quick. Um, some featured groups. We've got some really good groups to watch. You've got Bryson DeChambeau, John Rahm, and Ricky Fowler together for two days. you got Webb Simpson, Rory, and Jordan Spieth. You got Patrick Reed, Victor Hovland, and Brooks Kepka. That would be a really good group to watch right there because the pressure's on Kepka. Um, and then, you know, Hovland, I talk about Hovland, but uh, he's made every cut since the restart. He's had five top 25 out of the six starts. And then the other group you might want to keep an eye on Justin Thomas, Colin Markawa, and your guy, Hideki Carlos. So, all, a lot of big, not all the big names, but a lot of them are there. Um, should be a really good tournament this week. Uh, the Memorial, I was really into it. I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to want to watch this. I've never been a big fan of TPC Southwinds. Uh, way too much water there, and I don't know. It's not even a course I would want to play for sure. Uh, but uh, I don't know. It, it should be a lot of fun to watch this thing this week, Carlos. Yeah, my two picks for this week, you just mentioned them. Matthew Fitzpatrick and the Rookie of the Year, uh, Victor Hoffman. Just give it to him. Uh, he, he's, he's the Rookie of the Year. You're picking those? That's your picks? Yeah, those are the two for this week. I mean, that, I, I pick the same guys that you're picking? Yeah. it's, it's That a, never happens. That never happens. That's right. <laughs> wow. So anyway, yeah, that, those uh, are the two players I think you have to watch. But the story also, you have to see Justin Thomas. I mean, he just lost in that uh, playoff to Colin Marikawa. The way that he, he, he lost it, you can bet he's coming out back with a vengeance. I mean, JT to me uh, is coming back here to, to, to try to – he's coming back here to win. So that's one of the players that you have to watch. Now, John Ram, newly minted number one in the world, uh, and he's playing excellent. Uh, will he, what will be his focus right now? Because as uh, we're going to talk about the course right now in just a minute. This, are, this is a very different course than TPC Harding Park. I mean, the, than Harding Park. And uh, what is his, uh, his focus? Would it be on winning a major and just try to use this as a springboard to it, or just you know, I'm the for the number one player in the world. I'm gonna, I'm here to defend it. So John Ram is another player that I'm here to watch. And Jason Day, I think he's due. I mean, he's just coming. He's like being under the radar. And this is a course that definitely could suit the, his skills to 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 play. Now, this course is the TPC Southwind. It's in Memphis, Tennessee. 
it has previously hosted the previous to hosting this WGC. It hosted it was the host course for the St. Jude Classic. All the history prior to 2019 for this tournament is actually from the WGC Bridgestone Invitational, which was played at Firestone Country Club. So it's two different stories, right? But Memphis has now been a PGA Tour stop every year since 1958. Now, when you adjust to par, the P, uh, this this TPC Southwind is convert, currently one of the longest courses on the tour when you adjust it to par. Broadly, uh, Southwind is a par 70, course that plays at 7,238 30, 7, yards with water hazards throughout, which is what you don't like. I mean, it, it, if you see that, I mean, since 2004, when they did the course overhaul, more than 5,000 balls have taken a dip in the water. That's a serious number, by the way, 5,000 balls, more than five. You wonder how much of that is. Well, the most, that's the most water balls of any course and almost more than 1,500 than the second place one, which is TBC Sawgrass. So now most of the wetness will be absorbed by holes 12 and 18. 12 has seen more than 850 balls get wetter than Ethan Hawk in training day. So, and that's a lot to say, Fred. But anyway, what's your, uh, I think you already talked about the TPC Southwind, but any, anything else you wanna add before we talk about Tiger? Yeah, the only thing that we need to talk about, uh, weather is always an issue at Memphis. It's always very, very hot. Uh, so the guys have to be in shape. They have to stay hydrated. Uh, number two, it rains almost every day there at some point. So it's always an issue of guys not getting their rounds finished, having to come out in the morning, finish, and then you know trying to get back on track, long days for some guys. Um, so weather is always an issue at TPC uh, Southwinds at Memphis. So that's something to watch too this week. Uh, Carlos, you did a great job talking about the course. Um, it's the guy that uh, kind of, like we talked about, uh, Thompson controlling his ball up there in Minneapolis last week around the water. That's what you got to do uh, at TPC Southwinds. I think when Justin Thomas played so well here, I mean, he was hitting irons. He was he, he just lasering those irons, right? I mean, every one of them seemed like it was inside five feet that he was hitting that week. So um, that's the kind of thing you got here. There's not a tremendous undulation in the greens. Uh, you can make some putts on these greens. So um, it's the guy that keeps his ball on the grass that is going to do well come Sunday. All right, now. The big one missing is Tiger Woods. What's your take on him? He announced on Friday that he would not be teeing it up at this week's WGC FedEx St. Jude Invitational. Instead, he said he was going to focus on preparing for the following week's PGA Championship in San Francisco. So what's your take on that? Yeah, um, we saw Tiger's back was an issue in Columbus, and it was warm. It's not like it was cold or inclement weather or anything. It was warm. It was very very good for him to play there. Um, you know, I, I think he was afraid of playing back-to-back -back weeks, and he wants to really play in the PGA Championship. If he has any, thinks he has any chance at all of winning another major, that's what he wants to do and wants to protect himself. He done, didn't want to come to Memphis and hurt his back and then not be able to play next week. So, um, you know, after, after the PGA, you know, they're, they've got another week or two before they go into playoffs. He's in pretty good shape with that. So he didn't need the points. Um, you know, is he going to play all the playoff events? Don't know. Uh, we'll see. Uh, he's going to, he could probably skip the first one, but he's going to have to play the second and third ones, I would think. But then he'll have some time off again uh, before the uh, U.S. Open uh, is in September. So the, the season's kind of scattered out for him, but this just didn't fit. And he probably didn't want to take the risk if he had some back issues of affecting next week, Carlos. Yeah, I was listening a lot of uh, places. And, you know, to me, of course, this is what it was, the St. Jude Classic. So he's never teed up in this place, not the event, in that event, which takes place here at uh, TBC Southwind. So that announcement on fr Friday really... To me, it didn't come as a real chunk, even with it being now at WGC event. So I, as much as it pains 
the tournament sponsors and the organizers, skipping the tournament again this year makes a lot of sense for Tiger. First of all, you just mentioned it. Memphis in late July is one of the hottest places in the country. And for some reason, TPC Southwind tends to hold heat like a wool blanket. I mean, the brutal heat and humidity isn't a friend of Tiger's form, both from a health standpoint, I mean, both his back and overall weight, nor a preparation standpoint for the PGA Championship. TPC Southwind will be playing extremely firm this week especially with the Bermuda grass greens. Uh, while TPC Harding Park's Ben Poa greens will be on the softer side. So while you could argue that Woods needs all the reps he can get prior to the year's first major, given that long break and his already limited schedule, the two horses could not be more different from one another. So if he elects to go out to San Francisco earlier, get out, get out adjusted there, and play even maybe one more extra pra practice round out there compared to a possible four day stretch in the Memphis heat. It's a no brainer that going out west makes more sense. He's turning 40 years old. The, he, he will turn 48 years old, 45 years old in December. So he isn't too worried about reaching a certain number of events played. He's chasing majors and playing a course he feels comfortable at. TBC Southwind is not. And because of that, I think he made a great call and he will be uh, doing what is best for him and his, his health and he should be ready to play next week. I want to make one more point too, Carlos. And you look at the golf courses, okay? Look at the courses that Tiger has historically performed well at. Uh, Torrey Pines, um, um, Arnie's Place, Bay Hill in Florida, um, the Memorial at Muirfield Village where he's won multiple times. Those are all like parkland, rolling, tree-lined golf courses, traditional type golf courses. Uh, TPC Southwinds is not. You know, it's more like a Florida golf course with a lot of water. And I don't think uh, Tiger is real keen on that kind of golf course. Hardy Park is more like that traditional style with a little bit of rolling, uh, you know, trees, that whole thing. So um, I think that also maybe played in, in the decision as well, Carlos, the style of golf course that it is. Definitely. Hey, there's an opposite field on the PGA Tour this week, and that will be the Barracuda Championship. This 2020 edition is full of young players looking to pile up points and money. It's a 73,990-yard 70, 70, part uh, uh, 71, Tahoe Mountains Club Old Greenwood course is in its first year hosting the event, which will feature 300 points and $630,000 available to the player that will emerge as a winner. Now, Colin Mark Howell won last year's event, but of course is not in the field this year. Former Ryder Cup player Ryan Moore is maybe the headliner this year, and Ryan Henley is far behind it. Other notables playing on the field will include Brandon Steele, Alex Noren, who just uh, scored a top 10, Patrick Rogers, Brandon Grace, Martin Keimer, Kirk Kitayama, Pat Perez, Charlie Hoffman, and Maverick McNeely. Those are some of the names that will be there on the up for grabs at the title at the Barracuda, which is a spot for the US Open for the winner. Now the top two players, not, a, not otherwise exempt, in the top 10 in ties will earn a place at Wingfoot later this year. Fred, this marks the ninth year for the very fun modified stable Ford format where eagles are worth five points, birdies are worth two points, pars are worth zero. It's a fun format. I mean, let's see if for the 12th time, the winner of this tournament will make it his first win. Now the last three have done it. So look out and maybe we'll have another first time winner here. Yeah, you got uh, Lake Tahoe, you got thin air, you got long carries, lots of birdies, lots of eagles, lots of points on modified stable for scoring. Um, what's not to like? This is a fun event. Uh, the old international uh, was out of Colorado there for a long time. Uh, modified stable is a lot of fun to watch the guys. They just fire at pins because if they get par better, it doesn't matter. They're just going for birdies. So, um, or par or worse, I'm sorry. They're just going for birdies and eagles. That's that's really all that matters. Um, so it's it's a it's a kind of a more fun event. 
Uh, I'm not sure. Did you mention Martin Keimer is making his uh, his mm -hmm. debut this week out there? And you know, with this, with the WGC, with this opposite field event, and then you got a Corn Ferry Tour event, you're going to see a lot of new names, a lot of unfamiliar names this week, Carlos. So the, the the troops are getting stretched a little thin this week. There's a lot of spots for golfers. It's great. It's great to see some normalcy. Of course, it's not back to normal fully, but hey, we're seeing at least all the tours playing. And another tour that is playing again this week is another opposite field event, because remember the European Tour and the PGA Tour co-sanctioned the WGC. So there's another tournament in the European Tour. And, uh, you know, Northern Irishman Darren Clark won his third English Open when the event was played last 18 years ago. He defeated Soren Hansen by three shots. Now, you would ask me, why are you mentioning that? Well, neither player is in the field this week, however, because there will be no defending champion. The thing is that this week, what was called the English Open will be the Hero Open, and it will be at the Forest of Arden. The Forest of Arden has two courses, at the Arden and Aylesford, which were both designed by Donald Steele. Now, this week's event will be played in the 6,361-meter uh, par 72 Arden layout. The, the prize money will be 1 million euros. So you would ask, okay, so who do I watch? Well, let me tell you one thing. I think Chubankar Sharma, uh, it's, he's due for that. I mean, it's been over 36 months since he burst into the scene with that maiden tour victory at the Yoborg Open in 2017. Since then, he has been really quiet, claiming his second tour title at the Main Bank Championship that was in February two years ago. But, you know, he turned 24 last week, has slipped down to 316, but I think this is one of those tournaments and places that he can come back and make his competitive return and try to see how he can try to come on back. I mean, that's a guy that has a lot of talent. I don't know what happened to him, maybe injuries or something, but hey, something's happening, but I think uh, this time off, he, he's up to something, and he, he's one of the ones to watch. Now, the other one I have to, for you to see is uh, another one who just turned, he celebrated his birthday just recently, and that was Mean Wu Lee. He just turned 22 recently, and I'm going to tell you, he will be determined to make amends for last week's Miss Cut at the British Masters. In fact, since he claimed his first tour title at the Big Open earlier last year, which we documented. He hasn't made the cut in any of his three starts, but he's a big hitting one, and he should enjoy this big layout of the Forest of Arden, and will have acclimatized himself with the conditions in the UK by now. Now, Fred Thornbier Olsen, Brandon Stone, Pla Pablo Larrazabal, Stephen Brown, Nicholas Colsart, Scott Hand, Eddie Pepperell, Alexander Levy, Juice Loyton, the recent winner in the European Tour, Joe Stalter, Andy Sullivan, Thomas Eatry, some are just some of the big names, not big names, but no names right now on the European tour that will be joining the veterans like Thomas Bjorn and Miguel Angel Ismenes as the most probable to take home the title on the European tour's opposite field event. Yeah, you just, uh, you just pretty much covered everything I had, Carlos. Uh, um, I thought you were going to, you're going to miss Bjorn and, and MAJ there, but I uh, bet you, bet you got him in there. Um, all, I thought Thorbjorn was not going to play. I, the, the European Tour uh, cleared him. Remember, we had the story a couple of weeks ago, but he said uh, on advice of his manager, he wasn't going to play until all his legal issues were, uh, were cleared up. But uh, obviously, uh, he decided maybe he needs some money to pay the lawyer, and the attorney told him, hey, you better get out there and make some money because I'm going to send you a bill. So uh, I don't know if Thorbjorn Olsen is in the field. Uh, he probably didn't have to fly. Maybe he's just driving, so that's a good thing. So. <laughs> I don't know. So, yeah, we'll see him in the field this week, Carla. At least he won't be on a plane anytime soon. So <laughs> that's a good thing for him, for Thorn Beer. Hey, former Buick Open champion Jim Furyk and KJ Choi will be making their PGA Tour Champions debut this week at the Ally, Allies Challenge presented by McLaren. Furyk turned 50 on May 12th. He won the Buick Open in 2003 at Warwick Hills Golf and Country Club, which will be hosting the $2 million Ally Champ Challenge Friday through Sunday. The Buick Open is just one of the Fierig's 17 PGA Tour victories. For Shoy, 
He has won eight times, and he turned 50 on May 19. Now, why am I mentioning them? Well, they're making their Champions Tour debut because it's the first event on the schedule since the COVID-19 shutdown back in March when both were ineligible to play in the 50 and over events. They, were, they, they turned 50 in May. There were no tournaments for them to play, so they're going to be here. They're going to be part of a field that will also include fellow PGA Tour rookies uh, on the Champions Tour, Ernie Els, Mike Weir, and Brett Quigley, Tim Heron and Robert Carlson, as well as major champions, Werner Langer, John Daly, Tom Lehman, Retief Goosen, Vijay Singh, Mark O'Mara, and Tom Kite. Vijay is among the former Buick Open champions who will be chasing the Allied Challenge $300,000 top prize so that will, those Buick Open champions like Woody Austin, Brad Faxon, Billy Mayfair, Rocco Mediate, Larry Mice, Tom Pernice Jr., Kenny Perry, and Scott Bergplank might have some, uh, you know, heads up on the, on, the, on the course over everybody else. The defending champion is Jerry Kelly, who's also in the field, along with 2018 winner Paul Broadhurst and the reigning Charles Schwab Cup uh, champion, Scotty McCarran. The field will include seven members of the World Golf Hall of Fame. Langer, Ernie, Vijay, Retief Guzan, Mark O'Mara, Kite, and the international star Colin Montgomery. By the way, friend, I am inspired by Monty. Have you seen his amazing 40-pound weight loss? I mean, I saw him and I am like, wow, what happened here? I think he said... You know, Bryson DeChambeau, I have 40 pounds here. You need them. Go take them. But he looks absolutely amazing. I mean, he's like a different guy. I couldn't believe it. I, I, I'm done with this. You he's know, still, I'm going to get it and lose a flap. He still needs the man bra, though, Carlos. He still he needs, he's, you know, he still misses Dalfar. Always will be. I'm sorry. <laughs> but he has lost a lot of weight. He absolutely has. Hey, I, I want to mention, the only thing I want to mention here, uh, other than what you talked about, um, Tiger won here three times uh, when it was the old Buick Open. Kenny Perry won twice. BJ Singh won here three times. So long hitters fare well here at Warwick Hills. In the last 10 years of the Buick Open was held, Tiger, BJ, or Kenny Perry won eight of those last 10 events. They just kind of had a rotating thing going on there. Uh, you mentioned about Furyk and KJ Choi. We're in the field this week uh, making their Champions Tour debuts. Uh, the only other storyline going on this week, you know, can Langer get back into his quest to reach Hale Irwin's 45 Champions Tour victories? Uh, you know, he's, what, three or four short of that. So uh, this would be a good track for him. Uh, it's, it's a nice golf course. Definitely. Hey, the Corn Ferry Tours swing through Middle America. Proceeds to this week's Pinnacle Bank Championship presented by Aetna, contested at the club at Indian Creek at Ikehorn, Nebraska, out, just outside of Omaha. After last week's prize cutter championship presented by Dr. Pepper at the historically scorable Highland Springs Country Club, the players this week are going to be facing a lengthier and traditionally more demanding test at Indian Creek, which is a Frank Hummel, Mark Brother design which measures 7,581 yards and plays to a par 71. Fred, how about the, the Corn Ferry Tour and uh, this tournament here in Nebraska? The big thing is, Carlos, there's only two events remaining until the Corn Ferry Tour final series. Um, by the way, I got a note today that the uh, Nationwide Children's Championship in Columbus is going to be played without fans, which really is no surprise. They pretty much had to do that after the Memorial, no fans, Marathon, no fans. So uh, they're not going to have fans at the, at the, when they get into the playoffs there at, in Columbus. I'm sure a lot of guys had to make a difficult decision whether to stay on the Corn Ferry Tour this week or bump up and play in the, in the Barracuda because I'm sure there were some, pot, some spots open for some of the top guys on the Corn Ferry Tour. Um, so I don't know, this year, uh, you might have been, you know, willing to take a flyer and try to make more money at the Barracuda because the purse is so much bigger than what they're playing for in Nebraska. But uh, uh, don't know. We'll, uh, we'll see. Um, it, it, like I say, we're right down the end of the season for the Corn Ferry Tour. 
and the guys are fighting to get into those uh, – to keep their card for next year, for one thing, not have to go into the, uh, into the final series. Uh, and, uh, and also, they're, they're still going to give 10 cards away for the PGA Tour for next year. So those guys are up inside the top 20 are trying to move up inside that top 10, Carl. And Fred, with that, we conclude our previews for this weekend. So tell us a little bit about Point. As I continue to say, this is the perfect time to be in Northern Michigan. I'm up here right now, beautiful day up here today, Carlos, uh, 76 degrees, 77 degrees, got in a quick nine holes this afternoon, absolutely gorgeous. Boyne Resort has three outstanding locations, 10 golf courses to please any golfaholic. In addition, they have great deals on stay and play right now. Look them up. I mean, there's fantastic deals going on because you've got a world-class resorts and you don't have to play, you're not paying three, four, five hundred dollars a day. This is, this is very affordable. It's great value. They also have three world-class spas. You know, mom likes her spas, you know that. So you got zip lines, you got a water park for the kids, several delicious dining options. Um, it's just, it's a beautiful place. Do yourself a favor, take the whole family, book your summer vacation at Boeing and sell and see for yourself why Boyne and Northern Michigan offer the best values of the business. Uh, Carlos, I love it up there. Um, you got to get up here so you can get up there and go with me sometime. We'll have that plan. Hey, let's now talk about the pieces of news that we offer this week. And the first one is about Michelle Wee West. Uh, you know, she didn't sit around for a call. And what am I waiting for? What am I saying? Hey, when she heard that Pat Hurst was going to be the 2021 Solheim Cup captain, she texted her pug mom saying that she'd love to be an assistant captain. Hurst didn't give the nod right away, and, but We West got finally her wish. For two Solheim Cups, We West was in Hurst the player pod and greatly benefited from her nurturing approach. We West now hopes that she can help other players feel comfortable too, given that she's likely experienced every emotion there is in her five Solheim Cup appearances. She will be joining Angela Stafford as an assistant on her squad. So the 2021 Solheim Cup will be next year, September 4 to the 6th at Inverness Club, right there in your backyard in Toledo, Ohio. And, uh, you know, the, the <laughs> this week, the LPGA will be restarting the season at Inverness. And uh, there's going to be some prominent American names, and we're going to be talking about that pretty soon. Uh, Hearst won't be on site for the competition. However, as it's close to the spectators, but Fred, you can bet she and Michelle will be keeping an eye close, a close eye on the TV and those players. Yeah, it seems funny to be saying uh, Michelle Wee West, doesn't it? Uh, but, you know, that's, yeah, <laughs> that's, that's what happens to these, these young girls. They, they get married and they change their name. Um, but, I had to uh, practice, Fred. I had to practice. I, I know. And you just want to say, just Michelle, we it just it just flows off the tongue. We've been saying it for so long. Um, yeah, this is a no-brainer uh, for um, you know for Pat Hurst. Um, Michelle's been around the Solheim Cup for years and years and years. She's been a key a key player, a key a component of those things. Um, so yeah, I, I think it'd be very good to have her there. Um, and I, you know, we're we're kind of seeing a new Mallory or Michelle Wee West, aren't we? You know, with the with the child, with the husband, a family now. I, it just seems like it's a different person. Uh, I have to tell you, I've been around Michelle a few times when she's been in the marathon, and she's a little she's been she was a little difficult to work with. Uh, she didn't want to take time to stop and talk. She didn't want to mess with you, press. You know, she was kind of off limits. She did her own thing. Uh, she wouldn't come in the press tent. If you want to see her, you had to go out by the 18th green. She might give you five minutes, you know, that would be about max. And, uh, but I, I just get the feeling now, it's kind of like Tiger as he's gotten older. Um, there's still a lot of my demands on Tiger, so he doesn't have a lot of free time, but, and maybe this was the thing with Michelle, there was just so many demands on her time that she just didn't have, you know, she, she needed some time for herself, but she does seem to me a little uh, easier to get along with now. And maybe this will be a good thing working with the other players uh, in the Solheim Cup, uh, Carlos. So, uh, Look forward to seeing her in an Inverness next year. I think that both Tiger and Michelle Wee West uh, are thinking about their next careers after golf. 
you know, and they, they know they have to have uh, the fans' approval and the fans. I mean, they have the fans, but they have to be more approachable to whatever they, they want to do. So I, I just think it's also part of they, they, they realizing they need to be more down to earth with the people if you're to, you know, succeed on your second career after you're done playing golf. So, you know, it, it, it might be something. I know that the Michelle, it's still, she just played uh, for the first time her 18 holes and because her parents uh, took care of the baby recently. So she was able to play and she was like, it, she said like, uh, she's itching to see if she can go ahead and, and, and play again, maybe one more time or a couple of times or try to be a player again somehow. Uh, she says that she appreciates all the LPGA moms and how they have been able to, you know, give birth and come back to play. So that's uh, something more that is also on her mind. So we'll see if eventually we'll see her play again, but at least we know we will be seeing her at the Solheim Cup next year. Now, <laughs> one that we were just not, it wasn't a if it's going to happen, it was when it was going to happen. And finally it happened in the PGA Tour. And DraftKings is enhancing its sports sponsorship portfolio as leagues have continued to resume operations uh, that were suspended due to the COVID-19. Betty Company announced it secured a deal with the PGA Tour that assigns DraftKings as the organization's first betting operator. The agreement is an extension of DraftKings content and marketing relationship with the PGA Tour that they established last July. Now that deal also allows Drops Kings to offer fantasy golf content, which they already started to do. I mean, I was just seeing the, the, <clears throat> the PGA Tour page and I was like, uh, if you see right now, they changed what was the, their fantasy for the DraftKings fantasy preview. So now as part of that agreement as well, they will have the right to use the PGA Tour trademarks and will get advertising options on tour platforms. The company will also create content and video rights that will be allowing DraftKings Sportsbook solution to create pre-game and post-game betting programming, as well as distribution of highlights to users who have placed bets. So Fred, this is just the first one. We don't know the exact uh, financial terms, but we know that this is just the start of what we knew that was coming all along, which is starting to do some online betting on golf. Yeah, and DraftKings is a big, uh, it's a big name. It's, uh, it's an important player in the, uh, in the wagering uh, industry. Um, so, you know, they were the first ones uh, to, off, to be the official daily fantasy game for the PGA Tour. So this is just a continuation, uh, just a, the logical next, next step of that didn't realize that golf was the fourth largest betting market uh, for DraftKings. So obviously a lot of income potential there. And, you know, that was part of the deal when they were trying to get all this gambling, uh, sports gambling legalized in the United States. You know, they knew that it was such a big pie that even a 1% or a 2% piece was going to be a lot of money for the PGA Tour. And you know, Carlos, the PGA Tour if they're good at anything, they're really good at making money. They make a lot of money. And uh, this is only going to enhance their coffers. Uh, those guys that, uh, that qualify and, and get vested in the retirement program on the PGA Tour, they're only going to have bigger and bigger retirement plans. So, um, yeah, this is, uh, this is kind of cool. I'm not a big betting guy, and we've been following this story all the way up through in the state's approving it and, and going to the uh, Supreme Court and all that stuff. So, uh, um, yeah, I, it's a good thing. I think DraftKings is probably a good company. Should work out well for both companies, for the PGA Tour and for DraftKings. Carlos? It should. And, uh, hey, we'll keep an eye on it and see who's going to be the next one who's going to be allowed by the PGA Tour to start accepting uh, online betting. And we'll it's just another matter of time. I mean, like you mentioned, if something they're good at is making money, so they, they will be accepting much more after that. Hey, and something else the PGA Tour did was that they informed their players that it's lifting the travel restrictions for international players. They sent a memo out last Friday 
outlining a decision by the White House to end several of the mandated quarantine rules, which have been put in place due to the coronavirus pandemic. Now, according to that memo from Tyler Dennis, the players, caddies, and essential personnel are now exempt as, and I'm gonna quote him, these groups are subject to COVID-19 testing and screening through the tour's rigorous health and safety protocols throughout a tournament week. End of quote. <sighs> Got it. <laughs> this update is replacing the 14-day quarantine period that is currently in place now. This should ease the return of any of the remaining holdouts ahead of this week's uh, WGC event and the return of the PGA Tour champions, but not for Lee Westwood, which we mentioned hosted this past week's Bedford Ma uh, British Masters on the European Tour. He said he wouldn't be taking advantage of this new ruling and still plans to skip this week and uh, the upcoming uh, next week, the PGA Championship. But one thing, Fred, I, I can tell you, nobody's going to miss it. <laughs> not, not the sponsors, nobody if he's not there. Uh, but at least we're going to start seeing some of those big name players be at ease because they can come in and come out and go out as they wish because those travel restrictions are being lifted. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm kind of curious to see if this is, carries over also to the LPGA because, you know, we got two big tournaments coming up in, uh, in the UK. You got the Scottish Women's and you got the AIG. Uh, uh, women's Open Championship. So uh, kind of curious to see if the, the UK extends the same courtesy that America is doing for the PGA, for the European Tour players or the players from Europe. So uh, I haven't heard anything on that, don't know anything about that. I was going to talk a little bit about that actually later in the show. But uh, um, yeah, I, you know, it makes sense. Uh, these guys are tested all the time. Um, so they know when they come in, if, you know, if they test positive, then boom, they got to, they got to go quarantine then. So, um, it's not like they're trying to sneak in and not let anybody know or anything like that. So, uh, it, it kind of makes sense, but I am really surprised that they got this thing done. I, uh, that really, uh, I, I, any other president, I don't think would do this, but Trump, because he is such a big golf fan, I'm sure. He said, yeah, that makes sense. Let's do this. Where somebody else would have been really afraid of the optics and everybody will be screaming, well, why can golf do that and not somebody else? I'm sure there's going to be a lot of complaining about this as we go forward. But, uh, um, you know, Trump's kind of like, I don't care. Let's do it. It makes sense. You know, done deal. Um, so, yeah, kind of surprised, Carlos. Uh, yeah, it's surprising, but I, I think it's the right move in the, in the PGA Tour has proven uh, itself worthy of that. I mean, they have taken all considerations. And of course, there's no fans yet. So that's a big thing. I think that that takes a lot of the decision easiness on it because you're really more like, like the NBA that's keeping their players in a bubble. This, this is how they are basically. Yes, they're traveling back and forth, but once you get to the tournament, Right now, if you test positive, you're not going in. So that's part of another uh, thing that, that is good for them and some security blankets that you can see that are happening in golf that are not happening anywhere else. So uh, it does make sense what they're doing. And I, 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 like you, I'm sure there'll be plenty of complaints coming in the next few weeks. Why them and not us? But hey, do the things the right way. And that's how you get things done. <laughs> Another piece of news, interesting one, you know, the Premier Golf League is back in the news this past week because there was a report in The Guardian claiming formal offer letters worth hundreds of millions of dollars that were sent to a handful of players. You might remember by mid-March, Rory McIlroy, John Ram, and Bruce Kepka, then the top three golfers in the world had all come out to reject the PGA. Uh, a proposed world tour of golf's best players that is backed by the rain group, seemingly stopping any momentum the PGA may have had. The following players have reportedly been linked to the new circuit. Phil Mickerson, Adam Scott, Henrik Stenson, Justin Rose, Ricky Fowler, Paul Casey, and even Brooks, despite him previously saying 
I have a hard time believing golf should be about just 48 players, but he's been linked to it. Now, while the PGA, PGL would directly compete with the PGA Tour and the European Tour, Rain Grip has allegedly been in talks with the European Tour. And an European Tour spokesperson said, you know, for the past couple of years, they have proactively sought, been sought out by several private equity companies, all of whom are recognizing the strength, and this is what they're saying, the strength and influence of the European Tours across Gulf's global ecosystem. He says they have listened to them all, but that their primary focus remains to ensure that the remainder of this schedule and onwards to 2021 is robust and healthy for their membership in this constantly changing times. I don't know, Fred, that sounds like a, yeah, no, we are not doing anything, we're still there, but at least it's the first time we hear that they have been listening to some other private equity groups, including the PGL. They have not said that, but hey, that is one, when you say we've been listening, is because there is some interest from them. Otherwise, they would just say plain simple, no, we're not interested, we're going there. But it seems like the PGL is not going away anytime soon. And who knows, maybe the hurting European tour might be that weak link that might finally give in and hand them some of the life that they needed after all. Yeah, um, I don't think they're going away either. Um, they just keep coming back around. I mean, they've been pronounced dead about four times this year and they just keep coming back around. So um, in my mind, Carlos, um, a deal with the European tour um, seems to make the most, most sense to me with the PGL. I just don't think the Premier Golf League can stand alone because they can't get the talent away from the PGA Tour. The PGA Tour has these guys locked in. You know, they make a big deal about the prize money. The prize money to these guys is only about 10% of their income, okay? It's the sponsor money. It's the, the, the advertisements that they do. It's, it's all the appearances. Um, they, can't, they can't offer that on the Premier Golf League. They can't offer that playing in Europe, I don't think. So the guys have to play in America to get these sponsorship deals and these, and these big advertising contracts. So um, I, I don't think, I think the PGA Tour is still a tough sale. It's gonna to be tough getting these guys to come and play on the Premier Golf League when they can't, they can't. And, and like Rory said, you know, he said, I didn't like it. They were gonna tell me when I had to be there, what I had to show up, what I had to do. You know, these guys are independent contractors. They don't like to be told what to do. Um, they want to play where they want to play and all this kind of thing. So um, I, I don't know. I still think the European tour needs the money. You and I both know that. Um, so I, I think if they can find a way to work together that works for both of them, it seems to me like the Premier Golf League and the European tour, that seems like the logical fit to me, Carlos. Yeah, I, I, well, the way I see it, if you, if you think about it, they're just trying to shoo away slowly but surely, right? You start by taking, some, taking the European Tour, which already has some tournaments like the WGCs that are co-sanctioned. So if you take, get a stake on the European Tour, you're getting some insight already into the, into the PGA Tour because there's some, uh, some you know, co-sanctioned tournaments that you can play with. Plus, there's a Ryder Cup as well. You know, you start there, and if you see also, other than Ricky Fowler, who is already 31 years old anyway, but other than him, the players that are linked to it, Phil Mickelson, Adam Scott, Henrik Stenson, Justin Rose, uh, and uh, Paul Casey, they're not young guys, okay? So those are guys that they're past, they're, they might not be, they're a little bit over their prime, we cannot say that they're going to go back and be at that prime that they were before. They're going to keep competing for sure. They're going to be atop the leaderboards and win here and there, but they're really not the prime time players that they were once. So maybe those are the, because if you're here, those are the ones that are being linked to the new circuit. They're just saying, hey, we're listening, but that doesn't mean that they won't join them because at this stage in their careers, they might be just 
the ones that would like to have the money that they won't be earning somewhere else. Now, that, that I think this will be a process. I don't think it's going to happen just immediately, but they can start with the European Tour. Maybe these players, big time players uh, with big names, will start bringing them in and it'll be a process. But I think at the end of the day, like you're mentioning and we have talked about, I think it'll be a uh, uh, the combination of both tours that will be their bigger tournaments, will, which will really bring, bring finally that world tour that we have been talking about. Yeah, you, you know, if the PGA Tour and the European Tour could find a way to work with the Premier Golf League, I mean, it would be kind of cool to see the top 50 players or so competing a few times a year in just select events. I mean, we already have the WGCs, which which kind of does that, and they're pretty cool, and they're all right. Uh, we have the majors. It's already done that. Um, and then we've got a couple other tournaments like uh, the Memorial and like Arnie's that's been strong. You made the point earlier in the year about the Zozo uh, and the WGC and the, uh, the tournament in Korea, um, the Nine Bridges or whatever it is. Um, those could be very big events as well. And uh, you could really put together a really nice world tour that would feature just the top names in some really big purse events. And that, that would be kind of cool. But everybody seems to like their own piece of pie right now, and they're not willing to give anything up. They don't see the advantage for them to, uh, to give something up. So, uh, Carlos, I just want to mention before we get away from this that if anybody's interested, they can see that discussion that we had about the World Golf Tour that you uh, you kind of outlined uh, on uh, on our YouTube channel at Back Nine Report TV on YouTube, uh, just go there. It's in the um, it's in the uh, interview uh, line, uh, uh, the feature line on Back Nine Report TV channel on YouTube, Carlos. All right, now let's go to the practice range. Every week, you and I pick a topic, and each one of us, each one of us takes our own shots at it. But this week. It's the return. We're welcoming back the LPG Tour after the longest gap among the major tours other than the PGA Tour champions. I mean, finally they're back. Uh, the LPGA Tour is set to make its long-awaited return with the inaugural three-day LPGA drive on Championship at Inverness Club, having spent five-plus months in hibernation due to the coronavirus pandemic. I mean, I couldn't wait for this to happen. This is a newly created event, so there's no defending champion. Now, like I mentioned, it's going to be played at Inverness Club in Toledo, Ohio. Ohio, the center of the golf universe. Yeah. <laughs> See, you got me talking about yeah. that. Uh, that was... Convinced. <laughs> that course was designed by the world-renowned Donald Ross in 1916. It has hosted numerous major events, including four years opens, two PGA championships, and like we mentioned, it will host this 54-hole uh, event, which I take it as a bit of a teaser for next year's Solheim Cup, which will be hosted there next year. Now, this tournament, this uh, course measures 7,730 yards, par 71 from the tips, but this week they will be playing at 6,550 yards because they're welcoming its first ever, ever LPGA Tour event. It's going to be a $1 million uh, price money. Uh, Fred, what's your take on finally the LPGA coming back and this event this week? Well, Carlos, as you know, I, I do have a couple thoughts on this event. Uh, you know, I, first of all, I got to tell you, I, I saw uh, Christina Kim today. Did you see the outfit she wore on the plane? Did you, it's a fully, fully protected. Full man. hazmat suit. Got the big respirator things on the mask. Had goggles. I mean, she was totally enclosed. Uh, it was it was hilarious. If you if you haven't seen it, go to Twitter. Go grow to uh, Christina Kim's uh, Twitter feed and check that out. It's absolutely hilarious. Um, might have been a little bit of overkill, but you know, for Christina, it works. So okay. Um, one of the biggest things, you know, and I gotta say, I, I really. I'm tickled to death that the LPGA is in Toledo for two weeks, and I'm not even going to go, Carlos. I didn't even apply for credentials either week uh, because of the coronavirus. I know that there's guys that 
that need to be there to press and and they don't have that much room anyhow so i i just didn't even apply for credentials i was texting with a couple of players today as they were driving in and looking for places to play and want some recommendations on things to do and so we, we i did some uh some texting and some uh facebook messaging with some of those people but uh i don't think i'm even going to go out to the courses and our and our good buddy uh mike may is actually working there this week he's out there uh, working on the, st the electronic scoring this week, this week and next week. I'm going to see him a little bit, but uh, sometime in an evening, but uh, not even going to go out there. So um, a little bit about Inverness, Carlos. Uh, it is a little bit of a rolling piece of ground. There are a few trees, not very many, uh, very small greens. The key thing about Inverness is it's very small greens. Strategic bunkering. One of the best courses in the country. I don't care where you go. It is a wonderful, wonderful old Donald Ross design. The Solheim Cup is scheduled to be here next year, so you get to see, and yeah, you know, we don't get to see Emirates very much. I think the uh, senior tour, the championship was there in 2003 and 2011. Uh, the junior amateur was there uh, last year, but it wasn't on TV. They have done pretty much everything they could possibly try to do. They won another open championship there. Uh, the Solheim Cup came up. Uh, Judge Silverman and his team did a tremendous job, raised the money to get them in there for that. And then when they were looking, when Michael Wan was looking to, uh, to get some additional tournaments, boom, Inverness stepped up and said, yeah, let's have this here. Uh, it'll be the week before the marathon. The girls can be in one place. It's a late for two weeks to get kick things off, give them a good chance to see the Solheim Cup Inverness uh, a golf course. So kudos to Inverness for doing this. They're a private club. They don't have to do this, right? They don't need the money. Let me tell you, they do not need the money. So uh, they're doing this kind of out of the goodness of their hearts. And uh, I'm really, I'm really impressed. Uh, the old leadership in Inverness would never have considered this. Never, never, never. If it ain't a U.S. Open, we don't want it. If it ain't a PGA Championship, we don't want it. Um, they think they're just a little bit better than everybody else, which they are. Uh, but uh, it's nice to be able to see that course shared with everybody. So um, Andrew Green, I want to talk a minute about Andrew Green. Uh, this guy did a phenomenal job doing the renovation work there. He finished in 2018. If you're interested in learning more about it, I did a piece on him uh, and the Interventions for Renovation in Ohio Golf Journal. I didn't look it up, but I think it's uh, like July or August of 2018, maybe something like that. Uh, you can look that up and go back in the archives of Ohio Golf Journal. Uh, Andrew Green uh, does, did a magnificent job. One of the knocks at Inverness was that all the par threes ran in the same direction. He changed those. He changed some tees. He changed the directions. So all the par threes now go one's north to south, one's south to west. One's, you know, they all go different directions. He, he made a couple greens larger. Another knock was that there wasn't enough pin placements because the greens were too small. He actually enlarged a couple greens, so he added some pin placements for tournament play. And also for the members to have different looks as well. This golf course can be stretched to 7,700 yards, but as you say, uh, they're not gonna use that, not gonna near all of that. The other thing that they've done there, and if anybody ever gets a chance to go there and play there, they're gonna see a golf course that is just about as well maintained as any golf course that you may ever think of, like Augusta National or Muirfield Village. John Zimmers is the superintendent there, and John Zimmers was the uh, head superintendent at Oakmont, and he went through uh, two or three uh, U.S. Opens there. So he knows his business, and he does a fantastic job there. And one other thing, Inverness is such a great place that the head professional, the co-head professional at Augusta National uh, comes up to Toledo in the summertime and, and is, a, is a, a teaching professional at the Emirates Club in the summer. He comes from Augusta National, works at Emirates. So uh, it, it's a class place it's, it, and it's, you, you should really take a good look at it on TV this weekend on Golf Channel. Um, Carlos, I'm gonna stop right there for right now and let you talk some more. And I got some more stuff to cover and go over. So. Uh, I'll let you uh, go ahead and talk about some of that stuff. Well, just I just have one more thing to add about the tournament, and it's that you know Michael Wan is always looking for things to bring in into the into the LPGA, and one of the things that they're going to be introducing is that they ordered a thousand an order of a thousand whoop straps. If you remember, 
Nick Watney, which was the first golfer to um, test it positive for COVID-19, he used the whoop strap to predict because of his low respiratory um, uh, feature that it had to say, I, I think I need to be tested because this is not normal what was happening. And after that, Michael Wan went in and uh, got this uh, sponsorship done. Not sponsorship, just to get this deal done with them. So they're going to be all the players, the caddies, and um, their essential personnel. So they order a thousand and they will be wearing it during this tournament. So they, that is just another way of them to trying to go the extra mile. Hey, this is not going to tell you immediately that you have COVID-19. But through the things that they have learned, they have become successful in learning if somebody is, is, it has the COVID-19 or at least it might be getting it. So they said, hey, we're doing everything that we can to keep you safe. And this is just another way of seeing how Michael Wan is thinking outside of the box. Carlos, you know, we had Michael on the show right back at the beginning of this COVID thing, and I uh, did a Zoom call right from his, right from his living room because he was working at home just like the rest of us were. Um, and, I, you know, you, you hit on a great topic. Uh, we sing the praises of Michael Wan here, and justly so. He is the best sports commissioner in the country. I don't care. Uh, nobody's even close to him as far as caring for his athletes, putting deals together, being a salesman, being a manager, he does it all. Um, you know, uh, everything he does is first class. You know, I don't know of anything that we could say, you know, in the 10 years he's been in the job, have we ever criticized him for anything that he's done? I mean, everything he does seems to be a home run. So, um, you know, he was quick to pull the plug on tournaments early in the year when Asia was a hotbed of uh, COVID-19. He's not rushed back into action. Nearly every safety precaution is being taken to assure the players, volunteers, and staff are safe as they can be. Um, even though they have to go fanless uh, for the, the uh, Marathon Classic next week, it's still going to be all right. They're going to have a tournament. The ladies get a chance to play and make some money. So uh, he just does a great job looking out for his players. So with that, Carlos, just a couple more points before we get away from this. Uh, I, I, this is really the start, you know, we talk about a sprint for the PGA Tour. The rest of the, of the LPGA Tour now is going to be from now right up until December 20th. They're going to be playing pretty much every week. The only caveat to that is there's three events scheduled in Asia. Uh, I don't think those will probably go off. I don't think they're going to be able to have those. I don't think that a lot of the ladies are going to travel to, uh, to the UK for the Scottish Open and for the, uh, the Women's Open Championship either. So there are six events or five events that they can take some weeks off. But these next two weeks in Toledo should give us a really good glimpse of whose game has survived the layoff, who's ready to play. Uh, we've seen some of the LPGA Tour players do well in many tour events. They've been playing in men's events. Lexi was a runner up in a men's event. Um, uh, Nordstrom, you know, she did well in a men's event in Arizona. Um, you know, some of the ladies have been playing a lot of golf, even though they've been in their home states. So, um, but these two tournaments are really good, and they're really good golf courses. Inverness, as I said, there's nothing any better. And Highland Meadows is a great golf course for women to play. A lot of roll there, tree-lined, um, not big greens, but, I, you know, they're, they're not as small as Inverness but they're, they're not big greens either. So um, it's a little bit easier. You'll see the lower scoring at, at Highland Meadows for the marathon than you will at Inverness. I'm curious to see if even at a uh, little, you know, 6,500 yards, if the women go under par at the Inverness. If they do, it won't be by much, I, I guarantee you. Chipping is going to be a real good thing to have in your, uh, in your bag this week at Inverness because those greens are small and, and the person that does well there is he able to get it up and down from off the green uh, on a regular basis. So, Carlos, I know that's I, I covered a lot of stuff here. I, I'm, I'm a little jacked up, as you can tell. I'm disappointed that I'm not going to be there live, uh, but I'll be watching and I'm talking to people. So uh, we might even have some guests or some information for next week. Um, but, uh, you know, two weeks in Toledo is a good thing. And I'm glad to get the LPGA Tour back running up and again. 
Oh, definitely. And I think there's so many storylines that you, we can follow for the rest of the season. Like you mentioned, those tournaments that are going to be in Asia, will they be played? How many players will be going there? Maybe they'll be just international. Like this one is very uh, American heavy, the one that we're uh, celebrating this week. But we'll see how things start to play out, right? It's just the first one back, but we'll, we'll start to get a taste for it. But one of the things uh, that we have to look for, you know, one of the players that I think didn't want the pandemic to happen was in Bay Park. I mean, her, his, she's uh, the LPGA's most recent champion. She was the, the last one to win uh, at the ISBS Handa Women's Australian Open. Uh, I mean, she's, 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 she's already 32 years old, which is young, but old, uh, not old, but it's already advanced on the, on the women's game. So when you, given that form before the break, she had a win and a T2 in four events. I mean, it looked like she's poised to make another run. Will the pandemic shutdown have stopped that momentum that she had? We'll see. That's one of the stories that we have to see. Nelly Corda, a lot of people were talking about Nelly Corda. Will she be able to top, to, to be the third American to become the number one in the world? I mean, right now she's currently second in Yoko has a pretty good lead, but we don't know about her. I mean, we'll see. Nelly Corda has the game and she's been playing really, really well. So we'll see about Nelly. I want to see how well she does. The Americans are doing really, really well and good in the world's top 10, 20. We have Nelly at number three. Daniel Kang is number four. Lexi Thompson is nine. Jessica, the Jessica Corda. Nelly's sister is number 17, and Lisette Salas is 19. Daniel may be the one that had the most momentum among all of them. She had three, uh, four top three finishes in her last five starts, including a win in October. We have the pandemic also stop that, but the Americans are doing really, really well. Five within the top 20, and uh, of course, we already talked about Nelly Corda being close to number one. Talking about number one, can Ningyo Ko maintain that firm grasp that she has on world number one ranking? She's been there since last July, so it's a, a year now. She has only solidified after claiming four wins, doing two majors and 12 top 10 finishes last year. Can anyone challenge her? More than that, will she be able to maintain that? I mean, it's a tall order for sure. Her lead over Nelly Corda is currently over 142 points. That's Incredible. I mean, if you take into context, over on the PGA Tour, John Ram's lead over Roy McIlroy is only 39 points. So that should tell you how big Jin Young Ko's lead is. But how is she going to be informed? Is she going to be able to maintain that? We'll see. Now, Lexi Thompson, I mean, there was that uh, hype video that she posted on her Instagram, Instagram account that she's pumped to get back on the course. Uh, we want to see, I mean, we know that she endured a series of difficulties a few years ago, uh, 2017, 2018, including struggles with her body image. I mean, her mother, um, cancer diagnosis, her grandmother's death. But uh, it seems like she, she, in that video, looks like she's revamped and ready to go. And uh, we know that before those things happened, she was just on her way to number one, basically. So this restarted season of the LPGA begins this Thursday. I can't wait to see what's going to happen, Fred, for the rest of the year on the LPJ. I'm with you, Carlos. I'm excited. Uh, the fact that they're starting in Toledo for two weeks, I'm excited about that. And really excited the fans get to see Inverness. It's a, it's a great track. All right. Now let's go to our final pots. And the first one is that the RNA, which is the organizer of the Women's British Open, announced the rebranding of the tournament after announcing a two-year extension with the title sponsor AIG. Now this new deal, the RNA uh, and the AIG will run through 2025 and we'll see the competition retitled now as the AIG Women's Open. Previously, it had been called the AIG Women's British Open. So now the, the, this event is due to be played behind closed doors. It's gonna be from the 20 to the 23rd next uh, month in Royal Troon. Uh, Last year, the Women's Open saw a price money increase by 40%, and uh, the eventual winner uh, got that uh, big bump over Georgia Hall's previous one. So we can see now, you can see they have already, with this renewed uh, partnership, URNA has also launched a new tournament website 
So big things are in stake for the AIG Women's Open. The other piece of news I have is that, you know, while college golfers around the country are awaiting the official word on the fall season, the Golf Coaches Association of America is providing them with playing opportunities for them, regardless of what happens this fall. They, what they call the GCAA Amateur Series is an 11 event schedule of tournaments designed specifically for college players. It will begin in August, run into November. Events will be 54 holes over two days and be open to college golfers who were on the roster last season or will be this upcoming season. So as of now, we know that uh, only a few Division I conferences have officially postponed or canceled uh, fall golf like the Ivy League, the Patriot League, the, the Atlantic 10, and the Colonial Athletic Association. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen. There have been more among the NCAA's lower division. So we'll see what happens, Fred. Uh, we don't know yet, but uh, the GCAA is also looking to add to the schedule, especially if more conferences call uh, cancel fall action. At least it's good to see that those college golfers will have somewhere to go and maintain the, their college work. Yeah, you, you mentioned uh, you mentioned Colin Montgomery uh, weight loss program earlier in the show. Eddie Pepperell also uh, lost a bunch of weight. If you saw him on TV this week, he lost four inches off his waistline by eating only steak, liver, and broth uh, during quarantine. So there you go, Carl. And you know our good friend Brian Weiss up in Wisconsin is on that uh, gluten-free deal, uh, that that diet where you just eat steak and bacon and that kind of stuff. Uh, he's lost a tremendous amount of weight over the last couple of years and, and keeps it off and, and stays really fit as well. So uh, there must be something to that stuff. Uh, really sad news, Carlos. Uh, really hate this. Um, uh, Camillo Villegas, you know, we, we reported uh, a year or so ago that uh, their youngest child uh, had, uh, you know, was diagnosed with some, some, some cancer and stuff. And uh, she died uh, just the uh, last couple of days. 22 months old daughter. Um, so um, uh, our, our deepest feelings go out to Camilla Villegas and his family and, and uh, nothing worse than, than losing a child, uh, Carlos, that's for sure. Um, on a much lighter note, um, Caddyshack celebrates its 40th birthday uh, last week. Um, it's in the hole, just another young Cinderella story. Ty Webb, Carl the Greenskeeper, Judge Smales, Lacey Underall, just a few of the lines and names that every golfaholic can cite from memory. And most of us watched that movie way more than we care to admit. Uh, still one of the most watched movies of all time. Uh, fantastic. If you haven't watched it lately, uh, cue it up on Netflix someplace and, and give it a check. Um, also this week in Toledo, Carlos, I just want to mention uh, Renee Powell, a uh, good friend, legend here in Ohio. Uh, second African-American to play on the LPGA Tour. Uh, the LPGA Foundation just gave $25,000 to five uh, first tee and U.S. Uh, uh, girls golf uh, locations here in Ohio uh, in the name of Renee Powell. Uh, the first tee of Central Ohio, the first tee of Lake Erie, uh, the, the uh, first tee in East Canton, uh, which is uh, actually Renee's home course. Uh, the uh, first tee of Greater Cleveland and the first tee of Northwood uh, down by Cincinnati. So uh, uh, congratulations to that. Renee uh, has been recognized. Uh, a lot of awards from every major golf organization in the world. So uh, just another kudo to her. So uh, Carlos, uh, that pretty much wraps up everything I've got. Uh, Michigan Golf Journal will be coming out next week. Ohio Golf Journal will be coming out in two weeks for the August issues. Um, got a lot of stuff coming up here for the end of the year. As I mentioned earlier, Back to Report TV channel on YouTube has a lot of great interviews, golf travel, some fitness stuff, some golf tips. We got it all there, news, views, everything. If it's, if it's golf, we got it for you someplace. Come and check us out. Carlos. Yeah, I just want to, you know, second those uh, deepest condolences to Tomas Villegas family and him. Uh, you know, it's really tough, so our hearts go out to him. Uh, and also Eddie Pepperell. Let's talk. I mean, the, you, <laughs> let's talk. I, I'm on it. Uh, calling you. I mean, this is this is it. I'm done. I'm I'm calling you. We're getting this done. The slab is gone. So we'll <laughs> see. That's gonna happen. It's my challenge. 
Back Niners, that wraps up another week of the Back Nine Report. Thank you for joining us. It's always our pleasure to bring you the latest on the world of golf. Don't forget to join us and see us again next week here on YouTube. Or if you missed it, check it out. The audio version is on iTunes or TuneIn. If you haven't done so, follow the show on Twitter. Our ID is at Back Nine Report. The number nine is in the middle. My name is Carlos Torres, along with Fred Vader. We wish you to be happy, be blessed, and enjoy the great game of golf. Happy golfing, everybody. Look for us on the back nine. We'll see you.